Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, a big thanks to Rachel for organizing this. Uh, it's great to be back in, in Helsinki. It's a long story about how and why I'm presenting this particular paper. I'll spare you the details. But this is uh, very much work in progress. So sort of pardon the sort of rough edges. Um, I'm working with uh, uh, Shahriyar Banori, um, who's an experimental economist at the University of East Anglia. So everything that's wrong with the experiment is, is his fault. Um, so um, we all know that um, gender equality, inequality um, exists. Um, and there seems to be a lot of um, evidence that suggests that um, it's persisted despite, um, uh, despite legislation such as uh, discrimination laws. Uh, there's a huge literature on, on discrimination and there's an equally huge literature uh, that suggests that, that there are these um, uh, substantial differences in how um, uh, men and women operate in the, in the labor market that could also uh, contribute to this uh, inequality. Where we would like to place ourselves is this emerging literature that suggests that um, discrimination has uh, moved on from being very explicit um, and, and overt uh, to subtle discrimination. Um, when we started this work, we were not aware of a literature on, on, um, on microaggressions, uh, and we are you know, beginning to sort of find that out. But so far, um, the only paper that comes close to what we are trying to do is Basford, Offerman, Offerman and Berendt um, in, uh, in social psychology. And what they are trying to uh, do is bring, uh, uh, to present vignettes of uh, discriminatory behavior and then trying to figure out if people actually believe that this is discrimination or not. And what they're trying to show is that it takes a certain degree of explicitness before uh, people start saying this is discrimination. What we are trying to do is, is um, uh, sort of start off with this idea that valuing um, uh, certain colleagues less. So valuing input from uh, colleagues of color less and valuing women's advice, for example, or input in, in the labor market less uh, is, is a form of subtle discrimination that could potentially explain the persistence of, uh, of wage differentials and, and, and the glass ceiling as well. So, <coughs> so how do you <clears throat> uh, set this up um, in, in a lab experiment? So we are thinking of, um, of a work interaction as a difficult question um, that needs to be answered by, say, a team. And nobody really knows the answer of this difficult question, so people are sort of advising each other. And the question is, uh, whose advice uh, do you take? Do you value a man's advice uh, as much as you would value um, a, a, a woman's advice? And we present this uh, trivia task, and I'll explain this in a, a, a bit more, uh, to uh, students at the university that I work in, which is the Lahore University of Management Sciences. It's a very prestigious uh, elite university in Pakistan. Uh, most of our students are rich. Um, uh, a lot of them are bright, and some of them are both. Um, um, either way, they're going to end up uh, in pretty influential places once they graduate. Um, and the medium of instruction is English. Uh, if you come into, uh, into LUMS, you will not recognize it as a part of Pakistan. It's much more westernized in terms of dress. So uh, in, in some sense, we, don't ex we expect this to be, um, if there is discrimination and prejudice, we expect this to be you know, a sort of um, a floor to it, uh, uh, rather than <coughs> a floor or a ceiling, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, the trivia task is incentivized. We give a difficult question, and the closer you are to, uh, to the answer, the more money uh, that you make. So you'll make uh, 1,000 tokens if your response is 10% uh, of the correct answer, uh, 200 tokens if the response is within 50%, uh, and zero if you're out uh, of, um, uh, of the 50% range. And then the tokens are converted into money. People could make uh, anywhere between 250 rupees, which is about two and a half dollars, to uh, 2,500 rupees, about $25. Uh, and the average earning is about uh, seven and a half dollars, uh, which is a nice little lunch at a nice place, right? Um, 
that's the kind of money they're making. Um, these are some of, the, well, all of the trivia questions uh, that are assigned randomly. My favorite one is at the top. What is the maximum heart rate per minute of a hummingbird? How many eggs does an average hen lay uh, in a year? And so a lot of thought and fun went into uh, selecting these questions. What we had in mind were questions that are bizarre in the sense that, you know, nobody reasonable could actually know the answer. The, uh, the, the heart rate per minute of a hummingbird is about 1,200 uh, um, active, 250 resting. Um, and so it's a difficult question. Well, some are easy, but most of them are difficult. Um, they have all numerical answers, so we can you know, calculate distances from the correct answer and so on and so forth. And you wouldn't really expect um, a man or a woman to be better at this. Um, you know, how many eggs does an average hen lay in a year? unless you're from a farm, but that could go for either a man or a woman, right? So these are the questions. Um, and what we do is um, um, we give, um, uh, is something missing? Uh, this, one of the slides got missing, anyways. So what we do is um, we have um, uh, a trivia task where we give uh, 10 questions to the students. The 10 questions are selected randomly from the pool of 40 questions that you saw earlier. So this particular question is, uh, what uh, number is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Um, you answer 10 questions uh, in, a, in a row, and uh, you're reminded that um, this is how you will make uh, money on this, um, uh, on this quiz. So we get them to answer these 10 questions um, drawn randomly. In the advisor task, which comes next, we give them the same questions again. But this time, and there are lots of instructions that, uh, that are associated with this task, we say, well, there are a certain number of students, well, actually 25 men and 25 uh, women, who did this uh, task before you guys. And these are the answers that they chose. So would you like to revise your answer in the light of this advice, right? And again, the closer you are to the correct answer, the more money um, that, uh, that, you would, that you would make. And the outcome variable, which is, uh, some, which is what we are interested in, is whether the subjects change their answer in response uh, to this advice. Who do they value, right? Um, and the treatment is, of course, um, <coughs> varies the information about the advisor. I'll talk about it in a second. But regardless of the treatment, what we do is that every subject is matched with five uh, male advice, uh, instances of male advice, and five uh, instances of female advice, right? So everyone, regardless of whether they know who their advisor is, is matched with me both men um, and women. This is how um, the advisor task uh, looks like. So it's the same question, what number is the answer to the ultimate question of life? This is your answer, what you answered. Here is your advisor, her name is Katrina, her GPA is 3.2, her answer is 10. Would you like to revise your answer? Now in this, uh, uh, what is built in is, is the gender of, uh, uh, of the advisor as well as the GPA. So this uh, is the uh, gender and GPA uh, um, treatment. And then, um, uh, and then uh, you know, the gender-only treatment would be Katrina. The GPA-only treatment would be just 3.2 and so on and so forth. His real name. Sorry? His so real name. the advisors were asked, so when we did uh, 25 male and 25 uh, women advisors, they were asked to choose a name of their, of their liking. And these names are the ones that they were, uh, that they were chosen. Now, uh, and the advice is actually from the person who chose Katrina. Now, except for one person, one man who called himself Shanaz, everybody else, <laughs> everybody else uh, um, uh, had uh, the same, chose the same name as their gender. There were some men who would choose names like um, Hercule Poirot and Spider-Man. <laughs> and, and so we did a couple of robustness checks to see if, if that was having an effect, but, uh, but yeah. So, Initially, our, uh, our original design was based on having in the control treatment, not, uh, so in the, right now in the control treatment, we have nothing here. And all we say is, you know, here's an answer. Would you like to revise it? Um, 
originally what we had was a description from the advisor. So we'd asked advisors to say, you know, just describe yourself in two sentences. So you could say, I love baking pies on Sundays, right? Uh, and uh, that would be a description. The idea was then, then it would be easier for us to say, Katrina, who loves baking pies on, uh, on Sundays, uh, I gave you this advice. The problem was they started getting gender information, uh, predicting gender from the description. So we lost um, 200 observations uh, and we had to sort of remove the description. They're still trying to figure out if we can, um, we can incorporate that data because it's just huge and beautiful data. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, so, uh, so if you include the treatments with descriptions, we have 393 subjects, uh, 10 questions, uh, so that's 39, 30 observations. But what I'm going to present today is, um, uh, is all the treatments without uh, descriptions, which is 216. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, then we were interested in, uh, in figuring out if prejudice, the actual action of prejudice is correlated with any, some measure of sexism. And um, I was very interested in something called um, uh, ambivalent sexism inventory, which is highly cited in the social psychology literature. Um, and it distinguishes between hostile sexism, uh, which is agreeing with statements such as women seek to gain power by, control, by gaining control over men. Um, as opposed to benevolent sexism, which is um, uh, most women have a quality of purity that a few uh, women <laughs> possess. So they, uh, beware the knight in shining armor. But uh, we couldn't actually draw that distinction. Um, so I'll just quickly go. So benevolent, uh, so this is uh, how our scores look like. 2.7 uh, out of a maximum of, um, of five for men, hostile sexism. 2.9 for benevolent sexism. Um, much lower for, um, uh, for, for girls. This is how we compare uh, across, the, uh, across the world. We are actually better than Italy, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and, but uh, on hostile sexism, but Italy does much better on, on benevolent sexism. So I'll just take you, yeah. Um, one final thing, uh, these scores are, um, uh, the sexism scores are continuous scores, but just for, the, for convenience, I've just made dummies out of them. Uh, so if you have a higher than a median score, you are a sexist uh, and not otherwise. So this is what happens um, um, in, the gen in the control treatment. In the control treatment, when we, um, when we give you an advice um, uh, from males, and people don't actually know it's coming from males, they change their answer about 59% of the times. When they're given advice from females, but they don't know it's coming from a female, uh, they change their advice 65% of the times. It's actually, now this is just pure just data. So this is essentially saying the answers that girls are giving are somehow much more amenable to change than that for men. Um, we, we don't quite know why this, this happens. As soon as we give them gender information, uh, the 59 percent drops to 56. So, for, uh, so it's a drop for both uh, uh, male advice and female advice. But the drop for girls is is much higher. It's a 15 percentage point uh, difference. If we take a difference in difference to see um, what the impact or the prejudice is, uh, it's about uh, six and six, 12 percentage points uh, change against women as soon as, uh, as uh, students find out the, um, the gender of the advisor. And this is very uh, significant um, uh, at 5%. So all of these graphs, by the way, have a difference in difference regression at the back of them. These graphs are just simple OLS without controls because then we can just map out these bar charts. But then there's another set of, re uh, 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 of regressions with um, you know, clustered uh, standard errors and uh, question specific fixed effects and so on. All right. Uh, in terms of men and women, um, uh, so the difference in difference for men is much higher uh, at about 16 percentage points. Uh, for women, it's uh, lower at 5 percentage points. Uh, that for men is significant at 10%. Uh, that for women is insignificant um, uh, um, uh, at 10%. When we um, uh, further segregate by, uh, by sexism, non-sexism, what we get is that the sexist, uh, the, uh, the difference in difference for sexism is uh, nine and five, 14 percentage points here. This is very significant. The difference in difference for non-sexists actually much larger. 
because of this particular jump. They're actually listening a lot more to women in the control treatment, but this turns out uh, to be statistically um, insignificant. With, uh, with women, uh, it's all insignificant. Um, so the summary is uh, knowing the gender of the advisor uh, results in prejudice against women of 12 percentage points. Sorry. Um, this occurs for, uh, for men at 16, women at 5 percentage points, but it's insignificant. And then we get a result for, uh, that's consistent with sexism um, as well. Now, the final thing is that we gave them, uh, a G so this, the gender and GPA information uh, compared to the gender only information is essentially saying, we've given you some indicator of the merit of your advisor. Would you like uh, to take that um, uh, into account? You can see that it, qualitatively, the thing is improving. The initial sort of difference is six percentage points. The, um, in gender and GPA, it's about two percentage points. So this is, uh, the situation is improving, but this is statistically um, insignificant. And actually, no matter what we do, um, this remains um, insignificant. So this is um, uh, treatment by um, just men. And this is interesting in the sense that in the gender and GPA treatment, men are treating men, uh, women and men equally. But, okay. uh, but compared to, um, but st statistically, it's just um, uh, meaningless. And I'll just um, stop at this. Um, uh, both men and women undervalue women's voices. This is the bit of a question mark um, because there's significance at like 13% points. So trying to force it a little bit. Prejudice as measured by the ambivalent sexism inventory appears to be an important correlate of discrimination. Providing information on merit does not increase um, valuation. And I would really like to draw this result. I'm not sure I'd like your comments on this. Our results appear more in line with a prejudice-based theory than an informational asymmetry theory based on discrimination. Thank you very much.